All right, hello, let's begin this episode. The title I have here in front of me is Demystifying Asia's Anti-Democratic Rhetoric. I'll be honest with you guys, I don't, I don't think this title is going to stand for the actual YouTube video. It seems too complex for the message I want to portray, but uh, that's what I have in front of me now. I'm going to skip an introduction, but you'll understand straight away what we're going to be talking about throughout. I'll ask you a question instead. If I came up to you right now and asked you, what style of democracy does China practice, for example, what would you respond? Would you perhaps laugh at my question? You would deny it? I mean, I would probably do both of those things, but it doesn't stop me from looking further into understanding Chinese politics and Confucian beliefs in general to figure out myself what people mean by an Asian style of democracy. And I stress this ethical philosophy. It comes way back from the Han Dynasty in China right? Confucianism, because it hasn't just shaped Chinese politics, okay, which are more extreme to the authoritarian side. It also shapes the governance of many other countries in Asia, most of them actually, uh, from Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, the Philippines, all the way to Japan, to South Korea, even Taiwan, okay? And you will see throughout this episode, that my goal throughout is to show that Asian style of democracies and what they perceive as being democratic can be supportive or non-supportive of our reality of a liberal democracy, okay? Let's begin with a case for Lee Kuan Yew. I'm sure you've heard of him. Come on, he's the father figure of Singapore, right? And he believed very strongly in, in nurturing market economies, so similar to us, right? But he also said that it was important to reflect in every political decision the idea of group orientedness which which stems from confucianist beliefs okay this way to they be preserving asia's traditions and values and to achieve this confucian realities this is the truth here it involves to an extent limiting some freedoms of speech limiting some assemblies, some competition for public offices, right, public administration, political positions, and nowhere more do you feel these limitations than in China, out of all the other countries I had mentioned already, right? I mean, I don't want to sound ignorant. I certainly do not want to misinterpret the complex interplays of the history, especially the contemporary history of China, but I am aware that in the 80s, for example, when Deng Xiaoping was appointed, the country passed through a phase of change, right, of introspection, of engagement to Western-style political and economic ideas. And while they were all for, uh, for example, the ideas being uh, implemented to, to grow and capitalize the economy, many people, it seemed, uh, were still against the rise of the liberal side of the democracy being introduced, or as they call it, Minzu, remember this term, Minzu. Okay, some people were contesting that uh, Confucian beliefs they had followed for thousands of years already were to be lost because of these Western modernities. Okay, and this resistance, ironically enough, it was based on the second critique of Immanuel Kant. Let's leave it to that. This resistance it led the Chinese to extend a, a principle of their own democracy. They're going to call it Min Ben rather than the existing Min Zhu. Now, what the hell is Min Ben? That's a good question. A simple way to define it is people as the root of all polis, okay? And the father of Confucianism himself, Master Kong, uh, Confucius, however you want to call him, he said this following quote, and I'll quote it as well. The people are to be the most important element in a nation, then come the spirits of land and grain, and second, and the sovereign, the individual, is the least important for the nation. And there are similarities in his statements to Lee Kuan Yew's vision for Singapore. Okay, of course, Min Ben, linked to Chinese politics, is, is much more of a communist take. Although we know that China is actually very capitalist. Those that know, know. And for Min Ben to work, another important point we have to highlight there must be a degree of hierarchy of a patron-client relationship within the society, okay? Which sometimes means political repression can be acceptable and justified. Sometimes it means loyalties to the government should prevail, your own moralities of the individual. I mean, leaders and people 
they are tied together by various interdependencies, right? Acts of loyalty and subsequently acts then of also reciprocal duties as well. Um, and, and, and until today, bear in mind, there, there's a consensus in China, I believe. I, I haven't been there. I've, I've been to Shenzhen, Hong Kong, but not fully there. There is a consensus that a fully liberalized political system, like the one you see in the West, is losing the essence as people as the root, right? Which for them is a core democratic value. And even worse, they look at Western democratic societies today, they see rampant unemployment, crime, socioeconomic instability, lack of cohesiveness, right? Disorderly conduct, no one's patriotic anymore. And the Chinese society keeps favoring more and more Minben over Minzu, over ever changing to liberal democracy. We'll see where this goes, okay? Now, if you've been paying attention to, to this so far, you'll be asking yourself, okay, 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 you're talking so much about Minben, but why are you mentioning Minben and then Asian style democracy? What about Minben as democratic? Well, you could argue, you know, sure. It's people-centric, that's a core value of democratic initiatives, right? But I agree with you, the source of power in China when practicing Minben is completely meritocratic. It's not democratic at all. Electoral votes do not exist. So the government is chosen based on their merits. You can, this seems a bit elitist, right? Rather than on popular vote, which is a big no-no for us here in the West. Um, they rely, let's be frank, on an emperor-like figure, Xi Jinping, that acts in accordance to the interest of the people, right? That's his rule. Um, and, and, and their legitimacy is all about this point, right? The people's lives, according to political scientists from China, I took this from them, the people's lives are democratized by this very principle of the government dedicating itself to the well-being of the common person, of everyone, Okay, so rather than a liberal democracy, Minben is a sort of performance democracy, right? Uh, the democratic side of Minben comes from how people perceive and evaluate the leaders or emperor's performance. Okay, it seems a bit shady to me, but who am I? Who am I? But now, come on, let's, let's expand this conversation of Asian style democracies beyond China. We all know China is the most authoritarian case out of them all. So... Where else, this is my next question, where else do you see a patron-client relationship-esque uh, society active today? Uh, well, it's quite prevalent in Malaysia, in Thailand, in the Philippines, for example. The government is clearly run in a dyadic, uh, vertical-like political structure, right? Which extends from the powers of very influential figures, which they characterize as big people, all the way to the lowest strata of social class, uh, the peasants, right, the ordinary peasants, which are labeled as little people. And, and this transcends socially too, and more linked to loyalty as well. There's a concept of debts of gratitude, active in the Philippines. This is how they, they spell it, right, which involves reciprocal obligations and acts of obligations between two people, okay, and failing to repay these exchange bonds, these debts of gratitude, leads to a very serious infringement, right? To a very heavy level of shame. They call it hia, and definitely damage relationships forever between the two parties, okay? But yeah, back to hierarchy. My question was about hierarchy, not loyalty. Look at traditional Vietnamese customs, okay, this time. Their culture rests on beliefs of duties of the lower to the higher. Yes, of the, the, the ruled to the rulers, of the son to the father, of the pupil to the teachers, however you wanna label it, right? Obligations to superiors was the cement of, of most societies operating on Confucian orders like this. Now, of course, the emperor is obliged to rule according to strict moral principles, just as much as, as peasants are to follow their superior's command. Everyone has to respect this strictly for it to work. Uh, in Thailand's case, and in most cases of these Southeast Asian countries I just mentioned right now, modernization is kind of cleaning up this hierarchical system from Asian-style democracies, okay? Capital 
penetrates and permeates rural areas specifically where this is quite practiced. So uh, patronages lose therefore their essence in a way. So money is buying favors now. It's bypassing the personal and the affiliative channels of that existing patronage, of, of that protection, right? Of the ruler and the ruled. So capitalist modes of production, they allow villagers now to subordinate their services to many other clients at once rather than a one-on-one -on -one situation. Okay, this is what I'm trying to say. Then let's move to another interesting part of Asian style democracies, which I think is more prevalent in Asia. I'll be honest with you. I'd be generalizing. Okay, I'll be generalizing. There's other situations around the world that practice similar stuff. But from my observation, there seems to be a lot of commonality within Southeast Asian and Asian countries about this next thing, which is, I'm going to coin it, personalism. I don't think if, I don't know if it exists or not. I do. I think it does. Okay. Personalism. Asia has generally emphasized leaders controlling over laws controlling. And this is, again, generalized, by the way. Uh, most of these countries have deep-rooted institutional governance. I'm not saying that they don't. But think about it. Look at all the charismatic Asian leaders that we all know their names, right? Um, from contemporary Asia, 100 years back. We're only looking at a 100-year spectrum. You have Mao Zedong in China, Deng Xiaoping in China, uh, Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan, Kim Il-sung in North Korea, Kim Jong-un in North Korea, Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. And by the way, North Korea, I know they're not at all Asian style democracies, but I'm talking about the personalistic side of Asian politics this time. Uh, Nordam uh, Sihanouk, Cambodia. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew himself from Singapore, we know that. Marcos in the Philippines, Indira Gandhi in India, that's a good one. Uh, ne Win from um, Burma, um, Su Sukarno and Suharto from Indonesia. The power given to these people and to these leaders, it stems from the force of their personalities rather than their constitutional prerogatives. Let's be honest, okay? So when a leader like this eventually falls in their country, the whole country shakes up tremendously, okay? Because they relied on that leader's personalist nature. Now, in, in China and Vietnam, another thing I noticed, for example, and I read somewhere, is that leaders tend to keep their dignity away and aloof from the masses, away from the people. Uh, and, and from what I learn and, and talk about, it has something to do as well with Confucian uh, values of society, right? That used back in the days to see their leaders in some sort of mystique, okay? As, as a powerful figure behind the scenes. As long as these rulers, I guess, keep peace, silence, and harmony among their subjects and among their people, uh, everything will be fine. What's interesting here, this is what I want to get to, is that the Western leaders, is they, they have to behave counterfactually opposite to this, right? They have to be able to mingle and identify with the masses as much as possible. Politics in Asia is all a bit more about higher up contacts, I'd say. Okay, it seems more about personal alliances. There's much less bureaucracy. There's much less pressure groups. There's much less legislatures because these are more restricted in many Asian countries. So personal bonds do the job. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, thankfully, you can argue or not, I'm free for anyone's opinions, right? With the deaths, with the advancing of ages of many of these Asian leaders, right, that I've mentioned so far, this side of Asian style democracy is changing quite a bit, okay, away from personalism, where leadership success starts to become more preponderant than personalist charisma of the leaders. I'll say that. I definitely don't want this episode to run for too long because then it's, it's boring, <laughs> but I want still to give you guys a fuller picture. Perhaps I'm going to do a part two of this episode as well next time where I'm giving my evaluation and opinion of what style of democracy I prefer, okay? Let's give another point which I think is relevant, which is authority, right? I think in the West, the youth and the upcoming generations, they automatically doubt their government. It's like a reality for them. And the Asian youth, from what I read and what I talk as well, are traditionally told to be more deferential to who's in power, right? It's, it's standardly unacceptable to criticize a leader 
unless they, they are ruling out of their mandate, okay? Uh, because criticizing a leader in many cases means criticizing the state, right? And, and, and Buddhist Southeast Asian societies, some of the ones in power were and are viewed as deserving to be in that place because of their karma, for example. And, and karma pertains to some of one's good deeds and bad deeds, I think. Uh, right? And this is a, a strong Hindu belief. Uh, so in, in a weird way from our stance, from our perspective, political order was or is seen in Asia as, uh, how do you call it, a, a microcosm of the cosmic order itself. So the king was to the kingdom what God is to the cosmos for us. Okay, and, and there are many stories of kings defying themselves as reincarnations of Shiva, of Vishnu, of uh, Indra. I don't know if I'm pronouncing these correctly. Uh, many monuments are, are built to the glory of uh, their rulers. And Angkor Wat, for example, Cambodia, that's the case. In the um, Sri Vijaya Empire hundreds of years ago too, right? And, and, and today it's, it's much less pompous, definitely less ceremonious than what it was in the past. But you still feel a bit of absolutism and hierarchy uh, realities in Asian style, even democracies, okay? A last thing I want to mention, which I think can be interesting for you, the listener, is the one party dominance of Asian style democracies. One party dominance, even though it's democratic. Singapore's People Action Party, the PAP, the Congress Party of India, the, the Gold Cars in Indonesia, these are all examples of parties that dominate single-handedly their own political systems and their respective countries. The same applies to Japan's Liberal Democratic Party, which has democratic in the name, okay? This is a democracy without alternation among competing parties, right? Democracy without change between the elites and opposition, because these dominant one-party rulings are many times factionalized internally. So what you don't see outside, you see within the party. So leaders of, of different party factions, they compete for a position internally. That's what I'm trying to say. Changes occurring, not so much via popular vote. And this democratic LDP party in, in, in Japan, they named every single prime minister from the 50s up to the 90s until a new coalition was formed in Japan called the non-LDP coalition. So there's the LDP and the non-LDP. That's how limited uh, Japan is in terms of political parties that are relevant to be voted in office. Same with Singapore's PAP party. I mean, they've never lost an election. Uh, most years they win with 95% of the parliament in their favor. Uh, in Indonesia, they have elections every five years, but they had only two presidents from the 40s to the 90s as well. And in their whole history, since the conception of Indonesia as we know them today, they've only had four presidents, even though they have elections every five years. Can you imagine? Okay, so in all these countries, the notion of democracy is there. But the liberal aspect of the voting system is not as prevalent. Take this as you want. How do they keep it that way, you can be asking. Well, many people, they support these governments because they come from as early as their, the, the country's fights for independence, right? From the struggles of colonial rules. So an identity rises in the minds of, of, of the citizenry between party leaders and state leaders as well. Okay, so in Indonesia, people might perceive that voting against the leading Golkar party means you're voting against the nation, okay? And you add to this the fact that most of these Asian-style democracies in Southeast Asia are growing consistently at higher rates than in Europe and the West, actually, over the last few decades. So a, a change of party becomes not only unthinkable, but kind of undesirable for the people. They prefer stability, they prefer harmony, they prefer keeping those Confucian traditions alive. So for them, the pillars of trust, loyalty, and return for the well-being of the popular mass is more desirable. Fair. There's a, to close this off, I'm closing it completely. There's a vivid statement 
from President uh, Sukarno from Indonesia. He had a lot of disdain for what he called majoritarian or the 50 plus one democracy that we practice, right? Uh, this Western concept, he said, for him is a huge cause of division for the population among the people, right? He wants what he called true democracy instead, based on traditional village-like procedures of making decisions through deliberations, through consultation, which they specify as Muzjawara, I think. And also then the, the search of uh, a finalized unanimous agreement, what he calls Mufakat, I think. Uh, these long procedures, they are placed in the spirit of mutual aid. Gotong Khajong. Gotong Khajong, right? Until today, it's the central theme of Indonesia and frankly, it's working well. I mean, I, I, I'm not one to opine, but from what I see from the outside, it's not doing too bad. Okay, we can keep talking about the cases for other countries, Korea, Japan, uh, Taiwan as well, but I'm, I'm definitely over the time I, I desired. So I might do a part two for this episode where I give my own opinion on that just a final evaluation, much shorter, between Asian-style democracy and, and Western democracy, who's winning. Okay, but this was Nungom for the Academic Observer. Thank you for listening uh, and see you next time. Bye-bye.